Where's that? Okay. Are you cool now with your gavel? I do have my gavel. All is right with the world again. I think you're right by a vent, too. Oh, could be. Okay, I need to do a little prep, and Jamie's not here yet. We'll call the meeting to order for Thursday, September 13th of the Capitola City Council. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Peterson? Here. Councilmember Botter? <coughs> Here. Mayor Termini? Here. Would you all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have some presentations tonight, and the first is the Children's Cancer Awareness Month proclamation to the folks at Jacob's Heart. And uh, who do we have here? Old friends, come on up. I'm Sue Quijano from Jacob's Heart. Oh, you don't get to do it from there. You get to come up here. I have to go up there. Yes. All the way. <laughs> All three of you need to come up here. I know, I know Jacob's Hearts people, and you really like being in the background, and I love you for it, but not tonight. Not tonight. Here we go. Honoring Jacob's Hearts Children's Cancer Support Services for 20 years of service to our community's families and declaring September 2018 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas in 2018, Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services marks its 20th year of providing local, family-centered care for those impacted by childhood cancer, and whereas each year, one in 285 children in our community are diagnosed with cancer, and whereas, despite improved survival rates, cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease among children, and whereas families of children with cancer in the city of Capitola receive essential services from Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services, a local organization that has gained national awards and recognition for improving the quality of life for hundreds of local children with cancer and their family members. And whereas, Jacob's Heart holds the memories and honors legacies of hundreds of children from our local community who have been lost to cancer. And whereas, the oncology department at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford has worked closely with Jacob's Heart for 20 years and is trusted as a trusted community partner in providing care 
that addresses the emotional, practical, and financial struggles of families of children with cancer in Capitola and beyond. And whereas Capitola urges its residents to recognize the impact of pediatric cancer on families within our community and to honor local children whose lives have been cut short by cancer, now therefore I, Michael Termini, Mayor of the City of Capitola, hereby declare September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the City of Capitola and honor Jacob's Heart Cancer Support Services for two decades of outstanding support in our community. Applause is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tamrini. Um, let's see. I want to thank you, Mayor, as well as the City Council um, for honoring children with cancer by proclaiming September to be Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Your dedication makes a tremendous difference in the lives of the children and the families here in our local community. Um, I would also like to invite everyone here. We have some wonderful events happening that um, are awareness, cancer awareness events, but they're fun events for families and children of all ages and parents. Um, the first one is in Watsonville, Sunday, September 23rd from 12 to 5 at the Watsonville City Plaza. And the second one is in Monterey for those people who would like to travel down there. Um, it's at Custom House and it's October 21st from 11 to 4. Um, I also have with me today two wonderful parents um, from Jacob's Heart. Um, Let's see, Steve and Leah have a daughter, Grace, who is a current Jacob's Heart child. And I think Leah's gonna say something as well. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank everyone, and especially to this community and all of our Santa Cruz communities for supporting Jacob's Heart. Our children um, just light up and they could just be children and have fun and not worry about appointments at all of the events and all of the the, they enjoy all the food and gifts that they get from all the, our local businesses. And um, our journey began on um, February 23rd when our daughter was diagnosed and admitted to Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. And um, Lucille Packard connected us with Jacob's Heart and they just worked a miracle. We are now part of a community of families and parents that understand our new life. And you know, without words being said, they support, and the staff at Jacob's Heart from our community support is able to give families what they need so that we could take care of our children and each other. So I thank you very, very much. Thank you, and I might add that you, know, you go beyond being servants, you're warriors, yeah. and we love you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is introducing our new building official. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, this is a great moment um, of, to introduce Robin Woodman as our new building official of the city of Capitola. Robin comes to us with over 20 years of experience working for different um, building departments, including nine years at Foster City. She's worked for the, um, the city of Santa Cruz, for the county of Santa Cruz, and also for the city of Watsonville. Um, and she's now fulfilling her, I think, dream of always working for everyone in this county. <laughs> <laughs> and working as, for the, yeah, as the building official for the city of Capitola under a joint position sharing with um, Scotts Valley. And so far, we're, uh, I think, Robin's stepped into the position. She's learning to wear two hats at each place and is doing a great job. So here's Robin Woodman. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi. We, we've, we've allotted you 20 minutes. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me to prepare anything. We've been waiting a long time for you, so yes. we're happy to have you. Yes, well, absolutely. I'm actually happy to be here. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. 
We have another new employee, a new recreation supervisor, which we're very excited about. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's my pleasure to introduce Nikki Bryant as our new recreation supervisor. Nikki emerged out of the most, one of the most competitive recruitment fields that we've seen in a number of years at the city of Capitola. There's a lot of people that want to do public recreation and uh, Nikki, through the course of the interview and the selection process, really rose to the top. Um, she's been working in recreation in public sector. She can talk more about it for her whole life. Um, she grew up in Texas, I believe, and went to the University of North Texas and got a graduate degree in Texas as well. And then she came here and has been working uh, in the our region for since 2004, I believe. For the past decade, she's been working at Hidden Villa, which is a camp over the hill, actually in Los Altos Hills, that I attended when I was a, when I was a young lad. And it's a really <laughs> sort of unique place, enjoys a unique place in my own personal heart, just because I had some wonderful experiences there. And it's with that, oh, and one of the other things is she brings a whole host of other skills outside of management and recreation in terms, including lifeguard experience, ropes course, rock climbing, circus arts. And in addition, I just found out today, she knows something about archery as well. So, well-versed with that, welcome to our city. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce myself. I'm really excited to be joining the city of Capitola and the recreation department. Um, yeah, I've, I've been involved in this business for my whole life um, and I've had uh, one week so far <laughs> to be able to get to know um, the staff at the rec center. And I'm just absolutely delighted that we are so resource rich with the current staff that we have there, the experience um, that they bring and the ideas that they have in order to be able to really enliven our recreation program and the opportunities that um, the Recreation Center has um, to, again, be able to offer a really dynamic program to the community. So I'm, I'm excited to get to work and um, see what we, can, what we can offer for this community. You'll find that Capitola is very much one big summer camp. So I think you'll have a good time here. Thank Welcome. you very much. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Can we have a report on closed session, please? <coughs> No reportable action. Thank you. Uh, before I go further, I would like to let you know that we're being broadcast live on Channel 8, AT&T, and UVerse Channel 99. Our uh, technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. Please keep your cell phones off and sign your name when you come up to speak to us. And we'll go on to um, any additional materials. We had one communication that was received today. There's copies on the dais as well as the back, a communication for um, item 9B. Very good, thank you. Are there any additions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. <coughs> now we'll go on to public comments. This is the time where anyone from the public can address the council on items that are not on this evening's agenda. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us on items not on tonight's agenda? Then we'll move on to city council and treasurer comments. Mr. Treasurer, what do you have to say to us? I'd like to talk a little bit about the Committee on the Environment because we've got an, a big event coming up that one of you at least has been involved in, and that is the Peary Park Soquel Creek Restoration Project, which has been dragging on, it seems, for a while. Started out with several volunteer events. We did ivy poles, we did replanting, and then we kind of got bogged down because we needed some extra money, which the council provided in the way of surplus dedicated tree fund money, but also because we needed permission from the Fish and Game Department. So we cleared that last hurdle because Kalish did his wood rat survey and passed. And now, as of starting September 24th, George McMenamin and his crew will be out there for at least three days, finally getting down to the creek bed and finishing the job we started, what was it, three years ago now? Um, and you might want to go down there and sometime this, that week and take a look at his progress because if you like what he's done there is certainly opportunities to go across the creek to look at noble gulch and try to restore the creek along larger periods of its uh, length so uh, appreciate any efforts to uh, take a look at that 
What were those dates again? September 24th uh, is the Monday, and he's tentatively finishing the 27th. Great. Thank you very much. Staff, any comments? I think Steve has an update for us on some public works projects that are underway. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, quick update, uh, the slurry seal project will be hitting its stride next week. Uh, we'll be doing work on various streets uh, throughout the city um, and uh, people can expect uh, detours, road closures. We'll try and uh, keep local residents and businesses uh, access as best we can, but there will be some certain amount of inconvenience. Um, every day next week on various streets are gonna kind of bounce around uh, different streets, do part of a street, and then come back the next day and finish it. So they'll be in and around. Um, if anybody needs a, a fine schedule, uh, exact schedule, they can call the Public Works uh, office. On uh, 38th Avenue, uh, the sidewalk project there, that'll be, I understand, kicking off next Tuesday with the demolition of some existing sidewalk there and should take about a couple weeks to, prepare, uh, to complete. Great, and we've been seeing you preparing for the slurry seal around town and we appreciate that. Parking lot? In, in addition, the community center parking oh. lot is gonna be included as I'm part sorry. of this project. You'll recall the council gave yes. authorization to add that as a change order and so. That, that's actually gonna be tomorrow. And that's the Jade Street Park Community Center parking lot right. along with the tennis courts. So the, the basketball, basketball court, court is gonna be slurry sealed as part of the slurry seal project. The Wonderful, following week. that's great, good to hear. Um, council, Ed. Um, you know, we uh, sometimes pay attention to uh, the city's uh, departments and give them acknowledgement, and uh, our police department and public works do an excellent job, but one group that sometimes we don't acknowledge is the uh, Central Fire Protection District, which provides fire protection, and uh, last night there was a fire in, uh, in the village, 206 Capitol Avenue, behind uh, where Beach House Rentals is at. And I went by and looked at the building today and I just wanna put a shout out to the fire department for a very quick response. I think it's fortunate that they happen to be a thousand feet away from <laughs> the fire station where they are, which <laughs> helped. But the location of the building uh, where the fire was in the back of the building was adjacent to three other properties. And the fact that you know where it was and the it wouldn't exposure, it could have spread very rapidly. And I think we're all very fortunate for a great response and a good stop. And. Uh, there was some involvement from a bunch of locals that uh, actually I heard went in and, and got the woman out of the building. I believe it was the cooks from the kitchen at Bellaroma. So huh. just a, a good community effort to get out there and, uh, and I just want to acknowledge that effort. Um, also, you know, the city council at time to time, we received letters from people and sometimes we're able to uh, respond to those letters and um, there's, a, there's a service that's around town right now, which I'm a big fan of, it's called Next Door. And um, a lot of good comes out of next door when it comes to uh, advice that helps protect people, things about coyotes in the neighborhood. But sometimes uh, there's threads that start on there that just that just get into the weeds quite a bit. So just a little clarification. I, I just wanna you know shed a little light on one story. There's a building across from City Hall that's been under construction for quite a while um, across the street over here. And we've had some metal plates in the street for quite a long time. And lots of letters indicate that it's some kind of miscoordination project between the property owner and the city. And in this case, uh, unfortunately, it it's, uh, seemed to be a, a mistake and an error in the fault of pg &E, and that's been verified. And the city has been trying to do everything they could to expedite the project along with the property owner. So just for clarification, it was not the city or the property owner, it's a pg &E problem. And in addition to that, there's concern about the building being illegal in height. And uh, we have an ordinance in the city that allows in this zone for buildings to be 27 feet tall. I did a rough estimate today with, with some eyeball calculations and, and awkward measurements and came up with 20 foot, 26 feet, six inches. Uh, I went to the uh, building department today at planning and had them confirm, and it wasn't too bad, it's actually 26 feet, eight inches, which puts it four inches less than the maximum. So I just wanna acknowledge that, that you know, the facts are always here. We're always uh, available. If somebody wants to write us and ask a question, whether it's the police department, public works, or, or um, any other department, we'd be happy to do it, but um, just maybe the innuendo can just calm down a little bit. Um, and last of all, um, I would like to place something in the agenda, Mr. Mayor, for a future meeting. I'd like to uh, bring up an item about uh, maybe possibly establishing an ordinance to remove council members from receiving pensions. Good, I'm there for you. That's it. 
Kristen? Yeah, I just have two quick things. Um, one is I just want to remind everyone there's still time to sign up for the Capitola Foundation Golf Tournament. It is a charity golf tournament, and the uh, money that we raise there goes back to good causes in the community. And you can sign up for that at capitolafoundation.org. Um, the other one, I would like to ask for a future agenda item. A couple meetings ago, we were visited by a Citizens Climate Lobby and they talked to us about uh, a carbon fee and, and dividend, and I would like to see that come back on a future agenda with a resolution of support. And perhaps we can get a, um, a presentation by them so that we know what we're supporting and the, and the ramifications of such support. We can do that. Wonderful, thank you. Well, um, Unless you were under a rock all weekend, you realize that we invited 10 or 20,000 of our closest friends from everywhere to join us at the Capitola Art and Wine Festival. It was a great event and it, it was brought home to me because I usually pass out on f Saturday night and then wake up and do it on Sunday again, but I actually tried to go out to dinner on Saturday night and everywhere, every place was standing room only. I never realized the impact that that event had on the community at large. There were no tables anywhere, um, and it was just great. Everyone was having a good time, and it was flawless. And I wa also want to shout out, not only to all the people who put it on, but our police department, from parking patrol, community service, officers, sergeants, our captain, our police chief, they they worked double time on this. And I believe that um, there were no significant increases in calls for service, you know, in spite of the fact that we invited our 10,000 closest friends and then got them drunk. And, uh, <laughs> but they were very respectful and they were, they were drinking wine in a very appropriate way and, and it was nicely done and only in Capitola, just amazing. I would also like to announce that, you know, I'm your representative on the Monterey Bay Community Power Board. This is the, the power acquisition group that it now supplies three counties with power, unless you opt out. They supply power at the exact same price PG&E supplies power to you. And we're just about ready to give out our 3%, perhaps 5% rebate at the end of this year, which will save everyone that much. But more importantly, after less than five months providing the power to everyone, we are retiring two significant debts, um, a revolving line of credit and a standing line of credit. And if you recall, at one of our council meetings, we guaranteed that debt as a city. So all the cities and the counties no longer are on the hook for that debt. It is paid off and we're free and clear. And we're looking for, in the first year, three to $7 million worth of projects going back into this, these three counties for renewable resources. We also became carbon free uh, a decade ahead of time. All the power that's, that is supplying us in these three counties has zero carbon footprint. It is all from solar, wind, and hydro. In the next five years, we hope to shed hydro because it's not sustainable, but it is carbon free and we will get all 100% of our power from wind and solar. So anyone who told you five years ago that it would be impossible to get off of fossil fuel, sorry, we, we went and did it and we did it ahead of time. Um, sure. Feel Some free to applause. Yes. <laughs> um, and then if there are no other comments, we will move on to our consent calendar item that we usually take in a single vote. Is there anyone from the public who would like to pull anything on consent? Any of the council? I have one item I'd like to comment on, and that's item E, the uh, contract for local hazard mitigation plan update. Right now, the, um, the Carolinas are being pummeled by possibly the worst hurricane they've seen in many, many, many years. Um, we always have to be ready. We live on the coast. Things can hit us just as likely, and uh, we are prepared, and we work to be prepared on a daily basis. They're having 13-foot seas coming ashore. Think what 13 feet on the Esplanade would look like, and uh, count your blessings. So I'll consider a motion. Motion to approve a consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Consent passes, we'll go on to general government. We'll receive a report on the status of the construction of the Capitola Branch Library. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have a very short update here for you tonight. 
uh, quick give you the status on various items that are for affecting the construction. First was the amendment to the Library Facilities Financing Authority amendment, which will bring $2 million, an additional $2 million to, the, to our project. Um, with the adoption of the consent agenda a moment ago, you uh, approved that amendment for the city of Capitola. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz approved it last Tuesday, and it is on the schedule to be approved by the city of Scotts Valley on, on September 19th and then the County of Santa Cruz on, Sept on September 25th. So those will be the necessary approvals to complete that amendment and bring that additional funding to our project. Um, as you're aware, we have awarded a construction contract to auto construction. Um, that contract we've gone through, um, it's quite a bit to put the, the size contract together. And at this point, uh, they have signed the contract and it is transit to us. We expect it to come in tomorrow in which case we will then sign it and have an official contract in place with auto construction. A big part of the award that we made was completing two cost saving uh, change orders uh, for about $787,000. We've actually broken it into two change orders. First one is rather um, easy to put together. It involved items that didn't need a lot of redesign. That's about $300,000. We have given that um, detail to auto construction and we should have the pricing from it either tomorrow or early next week. <coughs> uh, early first indications I got late this afternoon that we're coming in very close to that price if not slightly under. The second um, change order which will have a value of about $487,000 that actually in involves some redesign of the uh, primarily of the foundation and mechanical, mechanical systems in the building, so those uh, design improvements are being made right now. We plan on issuing that uh, sometime next week to auto construction and then get a price from them a few weeks later. So everything's on schedule or is moving forward and um, looking at the budget and schedule. So the anticipated construction costs, since this includes the $787,000 value engineering is 11 million. $556,000. The budget at this point, which includes the $2 million from the Library Financing F Facilities Financing Authority, is $11,706,000. So we currently have a balance of $150,000 to the good just in the construction budget. We also have on top of that an $838,000 contingency, which is 7.3%. Uh, of the construction budget. So right now, everything's looking good for that. We also have about $700,000 uh, the, in the furniture budget, which I didn't include in the slide, uh, which is more than enough to put the necessary equipment and furniture in the library. So if things continue at the pace they're going right now, we anticipate the contractor mobilizing in mid-October, and we tentatively have a groundbreaking ceremony scheduled in early November. That is the extent of my report at this point. Thank you. Would anyone from the public like to speak on this item? Seeing none, Council? Ed. Uh, I'm, you know, been opposed to this project from the start and always concerned about the finances. And it seems like uh, through some work in public works and uh, some residual money, it's not as big a dent into the city as we had originally started. So um, I'm liking the way it's going. Thank you. Kristen? I'm excited and I can't wait for the groundbreaking. Don't let it slip any further. <laughs> okay. This is just a report, so we don't have to, mo no motion. No, I don't, this is just no, received the no okay. status report. Uh, next item is consider a request for sponsorship, the Capitola Water Festival. Um, consider, and it's a, for a grant, and I think we have one of the officers of the Capitola Beach Festival, formerly of the Capitola Begonia Festival. And I may have misspoke when I first said that. This is a grant for the Beach Festival, not the Begonia Festival. Sorry about that. Please step up and. So, color? We get color? Color. Mr. Mayor, we have a short staff report and then we'll turn it over to the. Glossy, all those things. Okay. I have a short, and, short uh, staff report. We'll, we'll move on first with the staff report and then we'll, we'll have the Beach Festival give their presentation. Mr. City Manager. Oh, oh, Mr. Assistant City Manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, so just a little little background. The city received a request um, from the treasurer of the Capitola Beach Festival for a $5,000 uh, grant sponsorship. 
prior to 2017, the city had actually sponsored the Begonia Festival in the amount of $5,000 a year. Last year, um, the Begonia Festival did not make that request. Um, the line item was not budgeted in 2018. Um, sponsorship, if approved, could come from the city manager, unanticipated events fund. What the staff is looking for is direction um, from the council on the sponsorship of the festival. I'm here for any questions. Questions of staff? Seeing none, step up. Festival people. Hi, my name is Teresa Green. I'm the treasurer for the Capitola Beach Festival, and this is Lori Hill also a member of the uh, beach festival team uh, i did notice in the agenda that it says water festival that ought to be corrected uh, the official name is capitola beach festival we went back and forth and back and forth yes we, we ended did up on beach um it seems like the community was not too happy with the end of the begonia festival and there were lots of requests for a follow-on event and so over the year we have put together the capitola beach festival which incorporates a lot of the elements of the begonia festival without the begonias um, i want to announce that that festival will be held the 29th and 30th of september the last week in september and it will have several of the most popular events that we've had in the past that being the sand sculpture contest the fishing derby, the rowboat races, horseshoes, and chalk heart on the seawall. New this year, we're going to have a Little Wharf three-mile race sponsored by the Wharf to Wharf Committee. And we're also changing the begonia-laden floats to lighted floats. That will be Saturday night. So that'll be a little bit different than, than uh, usual. Uh, the city has always been a s generous supporter of the Begonia Festival, and we are asking that you continue that support for this family-friendly and fun event for this year so that we can continue these types of activities for our community. So we are asking, and we have submitted a letter to the city manager for a request for sponsorship of $5,000 for the festival. Thank you. Anything to add, Lori? You're good. Would anyone else? Oh, go step right up, please. Dear Mayor and Council, um, this is not just another festival barging in on the village. This is the celebration of as much of the Capitola Begonia Festival as as the team could muster up without begonias, and it's put on by the same volunteers. Uh, there was a time, dear city, that the city not only sponsored the event with cash, but also waived all of the special event permit fees. Permit fees can run $5,000. Uh, the liability insurance runs $1,500. The porta potties run $1,000. What I'm asking the council to consider is this is the opportunity to have yet another event that celebrates the community of Capitola and everything that it represents. All it's asking is for the community to come out and play to a bunch of wonderful family events. And we are asking for the $5,000 that traditionally helped fund the Begonia Festival to be transitioned over to this new Beach Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Is there anyone? I mentioned oh, that we do have a few postcards <laughs> that people can pick up uh, with a list of the events. Thank you. Would anyone else in the public like to address the council? Then we'll bring it back. Ed. Uh, I think it's great to try to continue the condition. I think that uh, people were saddened by the end of the Begonia Festival, and I don't have a problem. I'll make a motion to authorize $5,000 for the Beach Festival. Is there a second? Second. Anything to add? Uh, you know, I just d I do want to say that I feel like we are writing the next generation of Capitola history right now because the Begonia Festival was such a part of Capitola's history. It's on our street signs. It's in our museum. You can go see it all over the place. And now that the Begonias are gone, I feel like we're this is the next generation of celebrations, fam family-friendly 
spirit of community kind of celebrations in Capitola, and so I'm really excited about it, and I do second that motion. And I, I won't make a lot of comments because, as you know, I'm the president of the Capitola <laughs> Beach Festival Committee, so I was kind of staying in the background until I felt the tone. And um, the hardest thing about it is containing the efforts and excitement of the committee members. I have never seen a committee more self-motivated and out to do things. It's, it's, a, it's a total joy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Thank you very much, festival people. Um, we'll move on to fiscal year 2018-19 sales tax revenue update. <sighs> yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I would like to provide you with an update on sales tax revenues and a little bit of overview on just general fund revenues in, in general. Kind of move on. Um, so just as a, a way of background, the Fiscal year 18-19 budget has 12.4 million of tax revenues budgeted in there, representing 78% of all general fund revenues. 49% of that is from sales tax revenues in the amount of 7.8 million. And just <clears throat> also that budget we had during the budget process reduced our sales tax <clears throat> growth estimates down to 0% after we got the 16-17 number showing that after multiple years of increases that had dropped down to a little less than three quarters of one percent. Um, the city works with a consultant that provides sales tax reports and sales tax audits and generally what happens is the data from the state comes in several months after the actual payments come in and then that um, consultant goes out and analyzes all the data and it tells us where that sales tax revenue is coming from, which businesses, with which industries, what's going up, what's going down. The first two quarters of last fiscal year, our numbers, and they have for years, matched exactly with what the consultant was talking about. So the first quarter we saw a 3.1% increase, and then the second quarter we saw a 2.9% decrease, which caused us a little bit of concern as we were going through the budgeting process. But again, those amounts were consistent with what our consultant was reporting to us. In January, the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration formerly the Board of Equalization, implemented a new software program. They went to an electronic format, and as with any huge software implementation, there's been quite a few bugs with that, causing a lot of merchants across the state to have to file paper returns. And those paper returns are coming in at the last minute and being processed really slow. So as a result of that, when we get the reports from the consultant, we're seeing different numbers than what we're actually receiving in payments. So in the third quarter, you can see our cash payments show reflected a 4.8% decrease, but the reports from the consultant were showing a 1.8% increase. And the last payment, which just came in a couple of weeks ago, um, indicates a 6.3% decrease, and we're still waiting for the reports from the consultant, which we should be getting shortly. But what we're hearing is that it's probably not a 6.3% decrease. But all of this, as you can see, is causing a lot of erratic kind of behavior within sales tax revenues, which again is our largest general fund revenue source. And then the uh, CDTFA, because it wouldn't be complete without an acronym <laughs> for the state, is reporting that they had 80,000 unprocessed sales tax returns from the first two quarters, or I'm sorry, from the third and fourth, fourth quarter from fiscal year 18-19. In addition to that, as we're all well aware, Orchard Supply announced that they'll be closing the Capitola location on October 20th, and Sears will be closing their Sears location in Capitola by the end of November. These are two of our top 10 sales tax generators, representing about 4% of total sales tax revenue. And uh, Lowe's Companies, which is the owner of Orchard Supply Hardware, is currently doing an evaluation of all 99 locations that they're closing and trying to determine from a business standpoint, do they want to get out of each lease or do they want to sublease? So city staff has been in contact with the Al family, who's the property owner of the Osh location, and will stay in contact with them as we learn more information and keep council advised of that. Saratage Growth Properties, which is the owner of the Sears property, hasn't let us know what their intentions are, but they probably are in a similar situation where, where they're figuring out if they're going to lease to other merchants or if they're going to just outright sell the property. 
and staff has reached out to them as well, just still waiting to hear back on what their intentions will be. Um, we will continue to receive sales tax revenues until closure at both locations. Um, I've been into the OSH store recently. There's a lot of activity, but um, they're, they're discounting prices, so I think we may see more activity, but with reduced sales prices, I don't want to hedge that we might see an increase, a slight temporary increase on the uh, sales tax revenue. And then also the Olive Garden will be opening in late October or is anticipated to open late October, early November. And while generally restaurants don't provide the same level of activity, that will be a, uh, provide some offset to the loss of revenues in the current fiscal year. Um, as a reminder, some other, we have a couple of revenue-based ballot measures coming up in November. First is the transit occupancy tax. Uh, voters will be voting on if they want to increase from 10% to 12% of that 2% increase on the ballot measure they'll be deciding. You know, well, the part of the ballot measure is that 0.4% would go to local uh, businesses, 0.35% would go to youth programs, so that makes that requirement for passage a two-thirds vote, um, leaving 1.25% of that revenue, if approved, going to the general fund. If it is approved, it becomes effective January 1st and provides really some relief on the sales tax front um, or on the, on the revenue front in the current fiscal year. The other measure is the cannabis business tax, establishing a 7% business tax on retail cannabis sales. That 100% of that would go directly to the general fund, but that would take a little bit of time to get going. So if it is approved, we don't anticipate seeing anything in the current fiscal year. That would probably come sometime after July of 2019. Um, as a reminder, 1819 budget, we did not include any of those anticipated revenues related to the ballot measures. So if they are approved, it would be additional revenue that's not currently budgeted. Um, as, as far as next steps, we're going to continue to closely monitor all the sales tax data. Again, I think we'll see the April to June data should be available within the next couple of weeks. And then our consultant that helps us go through all of that is working on a reconciliation of all the economic activity versus our actual cash receipts. The, what we want to use that reconciliation for is to um, request payments from the state to make us whole, make up payments, if you will, and accrue some of those back to fiscal year 17, 18, and then keep, be able to provide council with regular accurate data for the current fiscal year. Um, if those ballot measures fail, or if the tax data shows declines, then, then uh, staff will be coming back to the council with uh, budget options for consideration. And that would happen prior to mid-year. So we would be back earlier than normal with our mid-year, with at least that piece of it. And that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Kristen, questions? No questions. Ed? Anyone from the public like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, this is um, just receiving a report. So we'll move on to the bike share program overview. We're waiting for your two pages, buddy. Okay. Just crawl underneath and plug it in. That's right. Yeah. Want a, want a light? <coughs> okay, there's a short recess while Councilmember Botorf fixes technical difficulties. His microphone became unplugged. I'm going to try and figure out how he did that. And uh, no, I would never do that intentionally. <laughs> I'm the new chair. I don't know. How to okay, I understand. It's your new, new territory. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, Katie. Good to see you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor Termini and Council Members. Um, this evening I'm going to give you a presentation and overview on bike share and whether or not you'd like to Im start initiate the process for bike share in the city of Capitola. Um, over the past 10 years, there's been great strides in long-range planning here at the city of Capitola, including a Capitola bike transportation plan in 2011, the update of the Capitola general plan, and also the climate action plan. All of these documents talk about multimodal transportation in the future and lowering our carbon footprint for the city. And specifically within the bike plan, there's it calls out a future bike share program 
and um, I'm sorry, and the Climate Action Plan talks about a bike share program and the Bicycle Transportation Plan sets goals for more bicycle ridership by the year 2020. Um, bike share growth is on an uphill swing for um, throughout the United States and globally. Um, you can see in this graph since 2010, it's really taken off. The ridership numbers are incredible in the uh, like 30 million um, towards total number of trips taken and the 2016 uh, 20 sorry 2017 numbers the trend continues um, why is this trend occurring it's because of these the new bikes and the smart technology that's um, that they provide as well as the decreased cost to municipalities um, for implementing bike share programs in their cities prior to the new systems cities were actually putting money into the bike share programs and managing them, them themselves. With the new smart technology um, and the e-bikes, the electric assist bikes, um, th they're easier to read. They're also, they've got built-in um, GPS systems in which you can track where the bicycles are at, so managing a system remotely is, is a common task for these new companies. The payment is also done remotely uh, through your phone. And the bikes have the ability to be dockless and can lock, self-lock themselves. So that can be a, a good thing and a bad thing. We're, we're learning that um, setting requirements for locking is a good thing in terms of pedestrian flow. But just an overview, um, this is a picture of the Jump Bikes app and related to Santa Cruz. So with the GPS, you're able to look on your phone, see where a bike is available in red. And once you've located the bike, you can go up to it, pay for the, um, you download the app, pay for the bicycle on your phone, and take off on a ride. And then you can return it anywhere within their system or pay a fee to park it outside the system. So why am I here tonight? I'm here to see if uh, the city council is interested in staff initiating efforts towards bringing a bike share program to the city. Um, to do that, there's four steps we'd have to take to get this um, off and running. The first is to reach out to the public and find out if there's interest in a bike share program and to do our research. Next would be to select a vendor. Um, there's several steps in updating the municipal code that would have to be addressed and then also before setting up any locations in which parking stations would be provided, um, as, you know, um, they'd have to, we'd have to establish encroachment permits. Um, so within the first step of public outreach options, we can do a community survey. Also, um, we're thinking bringing presentations to both the Commission on the Environment and the Traffic and Parking Committee. And then in-house, we'd be doing research gathering. We'd be looking at best practices. We've already begun that in the initial research and then contacting bike share um, companies and see what are the different programs they offer, and also looking at regional coordination to, to make sure that these systems can operate interchangeably with other areas in the region, as we're seeing many bike jumps, jump bikes in, our, in Capitola these days from the program at Santa Cruz. Um, and once we've done our research and found out what the public is interested, we would identify the um, appropriate program parameters and then bring that back to the council with our recommendation of what a system should look like for the city. Um, and following that would be the step of going out and selecting a vendor that would fit within our program parameters. There's quite a few different um, new, it's an ever-growing um, trend right now for the bike share, so there's a lot of different companies out there that are available. And the third step would be to update the municipal code. Um, specifically, f street vending right now is not is prohibited within the code. So any jump bikes that would come into our city right now, they actually are prohibited, especially within the village. But um, you can come to the city of Capitola and put your bike on pause while you uh, go enjoy lunch, and then you get back on your bike and you've got to bring it back into the area in which it's allowed. Um, we would also need to update our encroachment permit program to look at exactly is, do, is there anything standing in the way of allowing encroachment permits for parking areas. And within 
we'd also want to update our bicycle parking standards. So um, something that's been really, um, either way, whether or not we adopt a bike share program here or do not, that's something that we'd like to come back to council with to really start uh, setting rules for where it's appropriate to park bicycles so that we don't have any of the issues in the future that we're seeing with um, bicycles being parked anywhere with the new dockless technology. And a little more on bicycle parking. When we would look into this, uh, we'd like to establish locking requirements. If we were to have a bike share program, establishing a bike share boundary is important. In San Francisco, they've been um, going through a phased approach of where they're allowing the bike share programs and looking at bike share boundaries. So in an area such as the village, if we had concerns of too many bikes along a already tight area, we could establish the boundary outside of that area so that the bikes should be parked, um, you know, very close by, maybe at City Hall, but not getting in the pedestrian flow. Um, so that, that's been successful in some areas. And then also creating docking station specifications of where docking stations could be for these bikes. So with that, um, looking for direction on whether or not you would like staff to initiate the research and establishment of a local bike share program and return to the city council in the future with program parameters. Katie, what would stop someone on private property like Knob Hill or the mall just reaching out to jump and putting a, a rack of jump bikes on private property at this point? Um, right now, if, if Knob Hill asked Jump to put a rack of their bikes out front, they would first be required to come into the city of Capitola for a conditional use permit, and they would have their business license would have to be attached to the, um, you know, it'd have to be more of a Knob Hill bicycle because that you're not allowed to just have a separate vendor outside. It, when you're doing a conditional use permit, it has to be for goods that are typically provided within the structure. So when so. I see things like the the water vending out in front of the grocery store at 41st Avenue that's outside, that's part of what happens inside the store, so it's mm -hmm. sort of consistent. Yeah, um, and the, in the new code we tried to address that more as well to fix that, um, that you can't just have a like a, a place to buy videos on the outside of a building to, to rent videos. It actually has to happen inside the building and not on the exterior right. anymore. And if we were to go through this whole process and take on a bicycle, you know, share bicycle vendor, then someone like the mall or Knob Hill could easily allow them to have a rack on their property. Yes. Yep. We would, um, you'd work with the vendor and establish where the appropriate locations are for ridership. And that's something that the city um, would, within a contract, we would also have purview of making sure that we agree with the locations of where they're placing. You know, Santa Cruz has quite a few of these around right now. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea of what sort of a deal Santa Cruz has with Jump? I mean, how, what they worked out detail-wise? Does the city um, get any revenue from this? Do they? they th their number one priority when they were establishing the um, bike share program was that it would not be of any cost to the city. So rather than I had asked them if they are doing any type of ta like to get any revenue from this, they're um, I'm not sure in terms of a sales tax when when you rent a bicycle, <laughs> but um, they their number one concern was that there would be no cost to the city. So. But oh, a couple points to add. N number one is I believe they have a five-year exclusive uh, franchise agreement within the city of Santa Cruz. I'm not sure if that's correct, but I believe they have an exclusive relationship with Jump Bikes that they've negotiated and then they've issued encroachment permits to facilitate that. So there's a specific relationship and there's a commitment about bringing in other competitors and sort of uh, to make sure that Jump could recoup their initial investment. And another point that I want to make is, is based on our initial research, one of the key things uh, that we uncovered is, is that this needed to be a deliberative process, deliberate process. Just letting this happen, um, some jurisdictions have tried that and it hasn't worked out well. Right. And really making sure that you have your code up to snuff and that you end up with a kind of process that you really think your way through rather than just letting it happen. Um, and even if we decided not to do this at this time, I think we would want to go back to our muni code and make some tweaks because I heard that this morning, how many scooters were dropped off in the city of Santa Cruz? 
there were a whole bunch of dockless uh, scooter rentals that were just dropped off within the city, which end up, as Rich Gruno, our former community development director, has been dealing with in Coronado, they can be a real problem to deal with. They just left literally in the sidewalks all over the place. So I think regardless of whether we move forward with this now or not, we do need to look at our muni code to make sure we have some protection so that we don't end up, end up in a situation where we're on a back foot trying to respond. Okay, did we get some uh, last minute news from the city attorney? Oh, I thought you made some okay. great discovery. Okay, no, sorry. Any other questions of staff? I, I have some comments, but I have one question before the public speaks. And just when we were talking about if the bike comes out of Santa Cruz into Capitola, it, 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 does the technology, because I'm not up to speed on these bicycles yet, would the technology shut down the electric power so that it doesn't work outside of a zone? It's not like the magnets on shopping carts. They, <laughs> they, they can just keep going, right? It, it's not, yeah. The restriction is something that doesn't exist right now to go inner jurisdiction. No, and you, you can go inner jurisdiction, um, and then you just have to return the bike into the boundary at the end of your ride, or else you get hit with a $25 fine. But the technology works regardless of once you go out of this their boundary. It'll continue to work. And you'll see uh, on the app, I've downloaded the app, and just yesterday afternoon there were four bikes in Capitola. And usually, and you get one hour that you can put um, a bike on hold, so you can go in, have lunch, put your bicycle on hold, and nobody can rent it during that time. Come back out, jump on your jump bike, and then um, go back to the city of Santa Cruz and back into the boundary and not get hit with a $25. The but, part of global but, but one one thing to keep in mind is if you do happen to see a jump bike in our village and you get the urge to grab the app and take it out for a test spin, understand that you need to be the one to return it back into the jurisdiction. Otherwise, you're going to be the one on the hook for the $25. Uh -huh. So I was just about to get one yesterday that was down in the village, and then I realized, wait a second, I would ha I'd have to get it back into Santa Cruz. Otherwise, I'd end up with the fee. Expensive ride. Yes. Mr. City Treasurer, yes. Yeah, I, I did want to make sure you mentioned it briefly that Santa Cruz made sure that there would be no cost to the city. So there would be no public works budget item to build racks or t locations. It's just staff time at this point. Is that what you anticipate? That was my understanding. I, I do not think that jump, I, I, would, I would have to call the city and ask about their bicycle infrastructure and make sure that jump paid for the bicycle infrastructure and the racks that went in but seems to the, the cost yeah. in which um, their their staff member associate was more around staff hours and the time put into establishing such a program it's certainly successful in santa cruz it's, it's remarkable yeah the, is there it, oh, I, they're at I, I had a second question yes. and, and that is you mentioned the climate action plan my understanding last time rich presented something on the climate action plan is that we already meet our goals for the next uh, 15 years or whatever so that you this is not required in order to help us meet a goal that we're having difficulty meet meeting is that correct you know there there are goals within the bicycle plan of um, increased ridership I want to say up to 5% by the year well, we have a state goal of reducing carbons to mm -hmm. MTBE whatever the heck the acronym is of so many uh, you know equivalent carbon units and and I think we're on track for, we've already met that, is that? We are. Yes. So we wouldn't need this in order to meet a, a state goal. <laughs> no, but it would definitely help with the carbon footprint. Understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address the council tonight? Indeed. Welcome. Hello, my name is Yannicka Strauss. I'm the executive director of Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I just wanted to share some stats that m maybe some of you guys already know from the Santa Cruz program. Um, within the first 30 days of the program, there were 11,368 total trips. Hmm. The average, there was an average of 5.84 trips per day, and the national average is one to two trips per day. Uh, the average trip distance was just under three miles, um, and uh, that is w believed to have replaced vehicle trips. That's about the average that people um, drive, but they can easily bike that distance instead. Um, and the total miles uh, were 33,454 miles. So just imagine all those miles being in a car um, and that you know this is replacing all of those miles. 
Um, bike share is great if you don't own a bike, if you don't want to maintain a bike, um, if you're worried about theft, which we all know is an issue, and um, if you simply want the convenience of having a bike nearby, like going to a meeting and then seeing a bike and uh, wanting to take it off to lunch or something like that. Um, I, so I urge you to explore a bike share program. I urge you to consider Jump as a vendor. A seamless program across the county is widely beneficial. It encourages more people to bike. It reduces the confusion of trying to switch between programs. Jump um, is, uh, uh, has rolled out in LA and in Sacramento, in San Francisco, in Davis. Davis and Sacramento um, have a regional pro Jump program um, and it just makes more sense. There's already demand here. People are riding their bikes. I live in Live Oak and we see them outside of Santa Cruz city limits all the time. Um, Lastly, um, regarding customer service, Jump um, has really great customer service. Their average response time is four hours, and essentially, if you see a bike that has been irresponsibly or um, illegally parked, you can report it. They will lock it down. They will contact the last rider and um, give them a notification, a warning if they if that rider does it again, they give them a fee, and if they do it a third time, their account is, um, is cut off. So there are actual ways to control how these things get parked. It just takes a learning curve in order to do it. Um, and lastly, I, uh, I'm sure your staff knows, but Claire Fleisler, the transportation planner at the city of Santa Cruz, is more than happy to share her um, lessons learned and, and how they made it all work. Um, so I really encourage you to engage with a bike share vendor and consider Jump. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Welcome. Good evening, city council members. My name is Piet Cannon from Ecology Action. I'd like to commend staff for um, being proactive on this bike share um, initiative. Um, you know, as people have said before, it's wildly successful in, in Santa Cruz. Um, so, you know, one of the stats that Yannicka just listed was um, almost six trips per day per bicycle. So, you know, it's, it's amazing when you um, ride around Santa Cruz or walk around Santa Cruz. I mean, the bikes are ubiquitous and they obviously they stand out, but more, more people are riding bikes and, you know, I don't know how far the, the jump can dig down to the data in terms of replacing car trips, but I think it's making it easier for people to get around in a sustainable fashion. And also, the, um, I think the great thing about jump bikes is being electric. Um, people can go further, faster on, on the electric bikes. And in Capitola, I think that would be <coughs> beneficial with, with some of the steep hills right here. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's taken off so well in Santa Cruz. And then I think, you know, the connectivity, if Santa Cruz is so popular, I mean, there's been a couple of trips where I want to go to Live Oak, but I didn't want to, um, you know, chance having a, a $25 fee, you know, having it taken it out too long and, and not getting it um, back in time into the Santa Cruz city zone. So hopefully I, you know, would recommend that the city move forward. I, I know the county is looking at moving forward and, and being part of the, of the program. And then also one of the, one of the, you know, the issues is there's a lot of talk about jump bikes and some of it's not all positive, right? So people have, are concerned about safety. People are concerned about people that helmets aren't worn, their electric bikes, they're moving a little bit faster. And then also just the way people ride. So Ecology Action and other organizations provide adult safety education. So maybe that's something that city staff could look at with Jump is like how could you provide some kind of bicycle safety education training that would maybe make some of the riders, um, you know, conform to you know more safety best practices, and also just making sure that you know they're not a danger to other road users. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the council? Our friend Sam Story. Always good to see you. Thank you, Mayor Terry, many council members, staff. Uh, I think it's very exciting that we're looking into getting jump bikes into our community. But as I was sitting there, it just kind of occurred to me, and this is maybe very established now, and, and this issue is maybe dealt with, but I was just wondering about the ADA issues. It is a city-sponsored program. You know, the city is subject to ADA. And I, I, I would just maybe like to see if the staff could look into uh, on that question and come and bring that back in the report 
and see how that's being dealt with. Thank you very much. Good point. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to Council. What is your uh, pleasure, Council? I'd like to make a motion to, let's see, what would the actual wording be? Direct Initiate staff. public outreach and research for establishment of a local bike share program. I'll second that. I have a few comments, though. And carry on. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's exciting to have a bike share program. Uh, my only concern about the bike share program is it's, it's something that's been evolving over time. I, my son's in Seattle. They had a program up there, and it wasn't so successful. And, uh, and I know, Yannicka, you're, you're an expert on all these, but it's, and I know that, you know, there's sometimes when we'd see a bicycle lane in a front yard for three days at a time. So obviously they've refined it here with Jump. Um, I like the idea you mentioned about, uh, you know, it being a seamless program integrated. I'm concerned about, you know, whether we establish a monopoly or something. I'm worried, you know, it makes sense for me to get on a bike feasibly. You, know, you could actually get on a jump bike, and uh, if we were all on the same page, we'd get on Santa Cruz and ride it to Watsonville. And wouldn't that be a great concept? Uh, so I think it's, you know, the position I'm taking, I obviously second the motion. I'd, I'd like us to move forward and look at it. I just have a lot of concerns, you know, the, 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 um, we're looking at electric buses for our, our buses and we're, we're worried about technology with, with uh, electric batteries. I would say the same thing about jump bikes. You know, it, this could be the model in 2018 and 2020 there's a better mousetrap. So I just don't know how as a county, because that's how I think about this program. I don't think about it just as a Santa Cruz program. Uh, we've seen the bikes in Capitola. It's something that's going to probably be good for the entire county. So I just, it, I'd just like to move forward cautiously. So I think it's good that we're going to take the time and research it. Obviously, I'd like to get some input from the county and see what they're planning on doing. And yeah, I'd rather see that Capitola is being part of uh, some cohesive program. It, I don't really want to go to bike racks and have all the bike racks in Capitola look like the Venetian hotels with all different color bikes. So. Um, I just think it's great. I think it's great that people are embracing bikes. The numbers in Santa Cruz obviously are overwhelming. Just would like to see it, uh, obviously, as you would as a, as a countywide program, so. Thank you. Kristen, anything? Nope, nothing more. There's been motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We'll move on to requests for proposals for tax revenue consulting program. And services, sorry. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so this next, I, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but um, I thought I'd spare you that one. So um, we've been, as I mentioned in our my previous staff report, we have a consultant that does sales tax um, reporting and auditing. We've, uh, and that consultant is Muni Services. We've been in contract with them since 2001, and they were purchased by another firm, Avenue insights and analytics earlier this year and have requested that we execute a new contract with them. Under uh, GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association Best Management Practices, they recommend evaluating these types of contracts for financial services every five years, similar to what we do with our auditors. In addition, um, we've been talking to, I've been talking to Jamie about getting an auditor in and looking at our TOT and, and whether that was better to do with with internal staff or use our new auditors or to, is there another vendor out there? And uh, actually Katie and I have met with a, a different vendor that not only looks at auditing <coughs> the TOT from those entities that are paying it now, but also going out into the Airbnb world and, and those types of things and looking at short-term vacation rentals as far as are they in the right zones? Not only are they just paying the tax, but are they complying with, with um, our, our zoning codes. And then also we have the cannabis business tax coming up and we're not quite sure from our standpoint if, if we're gonna need to dedicate resources to and, and at what level to monitoring those. So with, with those kind of three things up in the air right now, the TOT, the cannabis business tax, and then Avenue Insights now asking for a new contract, we thought this was a good opportunity to just go out and, and test the market Make sure we, uh, we do have competitive pricing on, on the services that we're currently getting. Are we up to date with technology on those services? And then um, just coming back. So I put together, it, the, the RFP is in the agenda packet and I wrote it in such a manner that one vendor could respond for all services or I could the, we could select multiple vendors depending on who does what best. So um, what we'd like to do is, is have council authorize and direct staff to issue that RFP. 
and then come back at a later date once we gather all that information and award a contract or contracts if, it, if appropriate. And with that, I take any questions. Ed, Kristen? So Muni Services does not do TOT auditing at this point? They do. They do. do they they do. It's yeah. just not one of the services that we currently contract with them. And they we, would also, they could go out into the short-term rental market and see who's out there participating. Are they submitting TOT? Are they in the right zones? They also do the um, cannabis business tax as well. So um, something that we do now with staff with regard to policing our TOT, we could offload onto these folks? Yes. Any questions? One point I would also add is is that the the state of the art in terms of TOT auditing and scouring the internet to finding these vacation rentals has actually changed. And these firms have gotten quite good at it. In fact, we heard a sales pitch from one firm that talks about they, they've developed an AI, in fact, that actually goes through and will look and figure out when units are rented, what rates they're advertising, and what the TOT should be, and whether or not they should be allowed and uh, or not. So. I think that there's going to be some real valuable services that we can uh, that we can consider through this RFP process. We once had an estimate of how much TOT we actually lose. <laughs> Does anybody recall what that was? Because it was a startling number. I don't know. Okay, good. We'll find out. Excellent. Um, anyone from the public like to address the council? Seeing none. A motion to authorize staff to uh, pursue RFP. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Good luck with that. Anything further, staff? Any other comments, council? Well, Capitola, then I'll bid you good night. Remember, you're lucky to be here. There's millions of people who trade places with you. Be nice to each other. Good night.